Our next speaker is Max Melman, comes to us from Case Western University, where he's professor of bioethics and law. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Where's okay? So, despite all the cynics and the skeptics, uh, I'm going to uh, assume that we have actually uh, developed, or at least that we're doing work on developing a moral enhancement pill instead of Lunesta, let's call it Lunesta. <laughs> <laughs> and the first question uh, is uh, how would we research, or what would the ethical rules be for researching a moral enhancement drug? We talked a little bit about this yesterday. One issue is how to balance its risks and benefits. Well, that depends first on what are the expected adverse effects of the drug. Uh, and uh, the second question, perhaps, is uh, how well is it expected to work? I'll give you a minute to do the math. <laughs> uh, and now, when we're talking about enhancement interventions, there's perhaps a kind of tendency to, um, there's a kind of tendency, perhaps, to um, uh, discount uh, the enhancement benefits. and. Uh, uh, a group of uh, researchers uh, and I had a, uh, just finished a grant from the NIH uh, in which we looked at the uh, rules, the ethical rules for conducting uh, human subjects research on enhancements and a series of articles including this one in the, um, uh, in the uh, American Journal of, of, of uh, uh, Law Bioethics. We concluded that there was no justification for weighing the risks and benefits of enhancement interventions differently from the risks and benefits of health-oriented research. In both health-oriented and enhancement research, we wrote, the potential benefit necessary to justify the risk will depend on the specific interventions being studied. Enhancement benefits are not necessarily of lesser value than health-oriented uh, benefits. Uh, but another question is, what, uh, how will we sort of, um, what process, what mechanism will we use to, uh, uh, to um, assess the uh, risks and benefits, to assess the, ethic, the ethical nature of uh, human subjects? subjects research on uh, this pill, um, will IRBs be able to do the job? Well, one of the problems, if you look at the common rule, is this uh, provision, which says that IRBs should not consider possible long-range effects of applying knowledge gain in the research, for example, possible effects on public policy, as among those risks that fall within its purview. <coughs> this came, as many of you perhaps know, from a concern by social science researchers that if IRBs were concerned about uh, policy issues, they would, uh, they would be uh, skeptical, they would uh, be hostile to certain kinds of social science research, such as on race issues. Um, but nevertheless, this, this seems to me to create the need for somebody, perhaps uh, somebody else, to uh, be considering these kinds of long-range policy issues. The NIH created the Recombinant DNA Advisory Committee to do some of that job for genomic research, and maybe we need a similar job, a similar body for enhancement research. Special concerns would be raised by Nestor research on vulnerable populations, children, pregnant women, and fetuses, supposing, for example, the pill had to be started in pregnancy, the mentally impaired uh, military members, uh, prisoners, and employees. Let's look at children for a moment. Uh, basically, the current rules say that it's okay to use children as subjects if the risks to them are minimal or less, and if there's a prospect of direct benefit to the subject that balances the risk. Now, the term direct benefit is not defined in the common rule, and health benefits rather than moral enhancements certainly are what the drafters had in mind, but enhancement benefit is also not explicitly <coughs> excluded. So depending on how you want to uh, uh, take that. Otherwise, there's a section of the common rule that allows children to participate as subjects in a special review panel appointed by the NIH, uh, by the NIH's Office of Human Subjects Research Protections, finds that, quote, the research presents a reasonable opportunity for further to further understanding, prevention, or alleviation of a serious problem affecting the health or welfare of children. Well, would Honesta qualify? Does moral enhancement alleviate a serious problem affecting the welfare of children? Interesting question. Balancing the risks and benefits uh, uh, is not only an issue for Honesta research, but also for the FDA, which uh, would have to decide whether it's appropriate to, uh, uh, given the benefits and the risks, to make it <coughs> to market the drug widely. Uh, assuming, however, that the drug has been approved and is <coughs> be marketed, should the law compel anyone to take it? For example, convicted criminals say it's a condition of being paroled, similar to uh, the practice of giving uh, depo provera to sex offenders in order to permit them to leave prison. Of course, why wait for the convicts to be paroled? Uh, this is uh, Moral Mouse, um, uh, and he is going to uh, take uh, Vanessa and give it to Bernie Madoff, 
Wally Stone person and transform him into a moral person. Um, for that matter, could the government use its public health powers to require everyone to take a master? Uh, an analogy would be immunizations. The legal standard for requiring everybody to be immunized was set forth by the Supreme Court in this 1905 case. The basic principle is this is okay if it is a reasonable regulation established uh, to protect the public health and public safety. Would mandatory domestic use be a reasonable regulation to protect the public health, uh, the health and public safety? Interesting question. An alternative to the government mandating that we all take the drug would be to give us certain incentives to do so. For example, only persons who were taking Onesta would be eligible for certain tax benefits or certain government jobs. What about the children? Uh, could parents be required by the law to give children the pill? Could parents who didn't be penalized, for example, regarded as being neglectful or abuse and neglect laws? Well, if you use an immunizations as an analogy, the Supreme Court in 1922, in a case called Zuck versus King, uh, upheld an ordinance prohibiting kids from attending public school without being vaccinated against smallpox. And there are some cases that suggest that parents who prevent their children from attending public school because the parents are refusing to get them immunized are uh, the parents are guilty of abuse and neglect. But there's no reported case that regards the failure to vaccinate per se as <coughs> neglect. Interesting question. Another question is whether public schools could require kids to take a nest as a condition of attendance, uh, as they do, for example, with regard to immunizations. Well, is moral enhancement analogous to immunization against disease? Well, is limited morality similar to having a, is having a limited moral judgment similar to having a communicable disease? Well, it certainly may have adverse effects on the health and welfare of others. Uh, but, and, and it's interesting to note that schools typically require vaccination against tetanus, which is not communicable. Interesting question. What about private actors? Could employers require employees to take Vanessa? Uh, this is the uh, head of our Cleveland clinic who doesn't want to hire anybody who is obese. Um, the, 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 the state of the law on this kind of thing is that employers may give incentives to employees to uh, participate in wellness programs, but they can't force them to or punish them if they don't. Uh, so actually, uh, Toby Cosgo probably doesn't have much of a legal leg to stand on. Um, if we analogize taking moral enhancement pills, uh, then it might be something employers, at least at this point in the law, could not require their employees to take, but might be able to give them rewards if they do so. Um, just as employees and jobs that affect public safety, for example, may be subject to more lifestyle requirements and restrictions than ordinary employees, perhaps the same would apply to people who work in jobs that require a high level of moral intuition. But what jobs are these? Uh, judges? Philosophy professors? <laughs> clergy? How about parents in general? In part, the answer to these questions depend on how accessible the drug is. For example, will a health insurance pay for it? Well, if it's regarded as an enhancement of the classic answer, has been no. Just like insurance won't pay for a Viagra, although President Clinton did order Medicaid to take more in 1996 until uh, certain, uh, certain politicians discovered uh, that um, uh, some sex offenders were also getting Medicaid to pay for their Viagra prescriptions, and they stopped that practice. On the other hand, as we heard from Jeffrey, uh, the trend towards medicalizing everything that we give someone a, can give someone a pill for. Um, restless leg syndrome, uh, male menopause, suggests that maybe uh, being immoral will be deemed a mental illness once we have a mess of, and then uh, and then we will be covering it under health insurance. In any event, the government could provide a mess of free of charge to us if the drug were deemed sufficiently beneficial. Finally, we come to the question of how the law will judge the behavior of people who do and don't take the pill. Let's assume taking the pill is voluntary, not required by the government. One alternative would be to hold them to a higher moral standard. In contrast, for example, to civilized countries, there's no legal duty in our country to rescue strangers, even if we can do so with no peril to ourselves, uh, unlike the rest of the, world, the civilized world, uh, unlike the civilized world. Now, the law could impose a duty on people to, uh, to rescue others if the people took the pill. In other words, if you take the pill, then you, then you are under a legal duty to act more morally including rescuing strangers. What's the problem with this approach? If the law took this approach, what's the problem? Well, the problem is it's classic legal conundrum. We would be discouraging people from taking the pill because then they would be held to a higher legal standard. 
And this is a fundamental dispute within the law. Do we hold people who invest in extra care or in obtaining extra abilities to be more careful or more considerate, do we, uh, do we hold them to a higher standard of care? Do we punish them, in some sense, for having taken those steps, for having improved themselves? The law's answer on this question is very unclear. What about criminal responsibility? Should someone who takes an ESTA and commits a crime be judged more or less harshly than someone who doesn't take the pill? Uh, it may be justifiable to treat them more harshly because they should know better, but again, treating them less harshly might be, uh, might be advisable to encourage more people to take the pill in the hopes that they would be, that we would as a society be, be uh, engaging in fewer antisocial behaviors. In part, the answer to this question may depend on how prevalent unestra use is, with, is within the population, how many people take it. If enough people are taking it, it will become a social norm, and those who don't take it and harm people might be considered at least criminally negligent. Another issue regards whether war fighters should be given this pill. Uh, we talked a little bit about this. Should we give them a pill to enhance their moral judgment in battle, or would this cause a breakdown in military discipline because they would uh, excessively question orders? Likely to be an issue mostly in the gray areas of the application of things like the rules of engagement. Finally, what about business? The general legal rule, as I'm sure you're all aware, uh, 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 is that you are, that is, is the rule of caveat emptor, buyer beware, okay? Don't expect the business person, the, the used car salesman, to tell you what's wrong with the used car she's trying to sell you. Well, what would happen to market theory if sellers took uh, Honesta and felt moral compunction about cheating buyers? There is a legal model for this, it was mentioned earlier today. Doctors and lawyers, for example, are held to be fiduciaries for patients and clients. They're supposed to subordinate their own self-interest to the interests of those whom they serve. Well, arguably, an entire market system could be created in which everyone was a fiduciary for everyone with whom they did business. In fact, I've often wondered why this isn't our general rule of law in this country. Well, what if only some business people took an ESTA? Well, perhaps, as was suggested by a question yesterday, there could be a uh, seal of approval uh, by the better business <laughs> And finally, we come to the question about what about international dimensions? And there will uh, be more talk about this in a moment, I think. But just to sort of think about this a little bit, it would be, of course, good to reduce war crimes. Uh, if uh, international leaders took on ESTA, there might be fewer war crimes. Uh, it might be good to, uh, uh, if they were uh, uh, able to become more empathetic towards others. This is the World War I poster against the Hun. You see how uh, he is depicted. On the other hand, the international system might be vulnerable to state actors who refuse to take the NASA. <laughs> and so the question is, what would our solution be to this? Well, one solution would be an all-powerful international policeman. But then we'd have to make sure that the policeman was acting morally. Now, uh, Ron Arkin and others have proposed that we could install software that would make lethal autonomous robots moral. Uh, Wendell and others have, have questioned whether this is, is realistic. Um, so perhaps the best solution is to, to, uh, is to call on moral mouse once again. <coughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>
perhaps an international discourse that is really more dialectical and somewhat more cosmopolitan. <coughs> Chuck and I deal with, of course, I also work with Bill Case here quite a lot. And so after these past couple of days, I don't have to convince you of this, do I? I mean, we've really pretty much gone, this is what I think it looks like, to this is what we think it looks like, to we can do something like this, and if we think it looks like this, we could probably intervene here. And so clearly one of the things that's happened is there's been an interesting set of heuristics that have allowed the translation of technology to theory and theory to technology. To do what we like to talk about is the idea of assessing or identifying, accessing, and then ultimately perhaps targeting, intervening. Well, we've heard a lot of these things with regard to how neuroscience and neurotechnology have in some ways allowed putative assessments at a variety of different levels. All of these are to some degree or another technologically related. Dealt with neuroimaging, these lovely pictures that we see over and over and over again. You can't swing a wet rope over your head these days without seeing these pictures of this, which sort of leads to this Wittgensteinian picture thinking that idea that brains are color-coded for easy ID, and there are only really four levels of neurons there, which is not really the case. Neurogenomics, perhaps, sets up the same type of thing. There are five genes to control your behavior. They all do X, Y, and Z, but of course we know that's not the case. We heard earlier about oxytocin. And the idea is that these ligands, these nerve chemicals, as well as a variety of drugs, like Onessa and albumine, or whatever else you want to call it, may in fact work with receptors. But the idea here is that those receptors are plastic, and that they do particular things that are bifurcated good environments that have particular sensitivities and in bad environments that have others. So we have to intervene here, not only on the genomic population and individual level, but also on the level of proteomics and phenotypics. The idea of individually assessing a, a personalized neuroscience. And is that, in fact, in some way, translation viable? Can we go from anatomy and physiology to populational variances, and then even plotting out, as you heard from Greece, individual trajectories and what that means? The answer is not whether or not we can actually do this. On some level, we certainly can. And I'm here to tell you that the pendulum swing is moving ever more in that direction. There's a big schism between what we can do and what we should do, and what we should do with the things we can. And that's interesting. Because each and all of these approaches that you've heard over the past couple of days that deal with the question of the moral brain have looked at this as a variety of input points for assessment, access, and ultimately, targeting an intervention. The idea of understanding that this represents a schematic diagram of the embodied brain embedded with its environment is important to understand, because it also communicates to you a relative inextricability. I've been a neuroscientist for 30 years. I have not seen brains just walking around out there. I've sat at plenty of bars, grew up in New York City, and that's still to see an amygdala sitting at a table doing what amygdalas do. <laughs> that's not my check. They're embodied in people, and those people are embodied within environments. And that brings up the socio-cultural issue. Now we have to throw out the issue of culture as both a medium, like a petri dish, gives rise to what? Genotypes, phenotypes, and a forum that allows the expression of particular phenotypes by interacting and engaging with a variety of factors that ultimately incorporate and produce, by a variety of detractors and constraints, body brain and brain mind. With a little tilde in between. And this is a symbol for complementarity. This is not either or, it's both and. And certainly here, this represents a true functional triad. And then these are embedded. And these outputs that affect the environments that feed back. Well, that's what we're really dealing with when we deal with the moral brain. So I pose this question. How then do we address neuroethics in the first tradition, which is really the cognitive neuroscience, of the neural basis and substrates of morality. We have to first, of course, define what morality is and recognize that there may not be a common morality, despite some of the arguments of the late Bernard Gert, who seem to argue that there may be some, and certainly alluding to some of the work of our colleague here in New York at Rockefeller University, Dr. Don Fox, who talks about the neurobiology of the golden rule. This is still interpretable. But that's really not what we're looking at. The work is being done by my group and the ones we work with, both the Center for Neurotech Studies at Potomac and ongoing the N3P3 project, <coughs> something called the Neurotech 2020 project, really looks at what are we, what are we studying. Let, let's, let's cut to the chase. Let's, let's take sort of an identity reduction and ask what we're really dealing with when we look at this first tradition of the neuroscience of morality. That's not really what's happening. We're really looking at something called neuroecology. And here's a wonderful 25-buck definition for it. 
I don't have to read it for you, but I think it reduces nicely to this. It is the cognitive neuroscience of resource and relational evaluation and decision making, which then we, as humans embedded in our culture and time and place, call that morality. We can look back historically and understand that, that the canon of morality has not necessarily been constant. <laughs> Things that are morally acceptable today were not morally acceptable 50 years ago. One can take a look at the DSM-5, for example, and see that shifts in our criteria, what we consider normal or abnormal, ordered or disordered, also reflect, as Thomas Sass suggested, a social dimension that is defined within these working constructs. But there is something useful here, because this ecology provides for us a proto-moral sense. How do we engage in these cognitions that are engaged in niche stability, niche activation? Who are we living with? Under what conditions? What are those interactions and dynamics? So our argument is that this first tradition of neuroethics, neuroethics qua neuroecology, if you will, has some value, has some putative value, in that it allows us insights wholly consistent with those philosophical tenets of science to be self-critical and self-revisionist, lest we succumb to being anachronistic, and heaven forbid dogmatic, we don't want to do that. It affords possible insights to these moral predispositions, cognitions, emotions, and behaviors, and then provides us some of the whys and hows that some of these ethical systems that we've heard of, deontology, utilitarianism, communitarianism, and certainly how agents interact, the agentic ethics, such as virtue, may in fact have been developed based upon where individuals and groups find themselves, the nature of those interactions, and it provides something of a gestalt view to say how is it that embodied brains that are embedded within their various cultures may in fact do this. But there are key issues here. Just by stating that, I open up a proverbial Pandora's box into issues and problems that arise from the intersection of the use of neuroscience and technology within the social realm to create definitions and to act upon them. And this is the working caveat. Because what this really bespeaks for us is this Yanusian vision. Oh, sure. On one side, I can come back and say, look what this allows us to do. We can create things like Onesta and don't be mean, and you know, look at the <coughs> nucleus deontologicus of Kant. There isn't such a thing, by the way. And so, if we if we interact there and stimulate there and get a living that works there, we can all hold hands and sing kumbaya. <laughs> but of course, you also recognize that we can take this just in the opposite direction. We can withhold those things and say, you shouldn't be nice to each other. You're kill yourself so we can win. Or I can look at those very same low sides, substrates, and say, if we can make it, we can break it. And look, let's face it, for those of you in the audience who know me, I'm the guy, this is the group. I mean, let, let's leave Bill Casey out of the picture because he works for a government agency, so we can't take any claim. But I don't work for a government agency. I'm the guy who, with our staff, looked at the weaponization of neuroscience and neurotechnology. I get known as the neuroweapon guy. So here I am, standing before you as Mephistopheles, saying, yeah, there's a bad side here, too. Is there a dark side? Yeah. And look, and I really advocate your scientific research towards the idea of national security. Because we have to know what these things can do. We don't want to be caught unprepared. And if we don't do it, perhaps someone else would. And that would leave us with the knickers around my knees. That's a neuroscientific term. And you don't want to be caught in it. For heaven's sake, do it right. And this really brings us to this whole area of neuroscience and technology, we call neuroescentivity. 